So I, I, I felt like the Lord is shutting doors or the Lord is making things difficult when I'm trying to save my own life. If you save your life, you'll lose it. And uh, it's just so odd how everything seems like resistance towards me. And uh, I, I guess we can mention Jonah now. We've seen Jonah, when God called him to do a certain work and to go into Nineveh, he left. And what was he met with? A tempest. He was met with resistance, wasn't he? Why? Because he's going against the will of God. And I believe for a long time, God's been calling me in this direction. Welcome back to Approved Unto God. I'm Joshua Govitz. We're in the book of Mark, chapter number one today. Mark, chapter number one. And uh, we're going to try to carry on with the calling of the disciples. Jesus has been baptized by John the Baptist. And then Jesus went into Galilee and he started preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. And he preached repentance. Repent ye and believe the gospel. That was Jesus' message. What's your message? Now Jesus goes over to the Sea of Galilee and he's going to call disciples. He's going to call four of them here. He's going to call Peter, Andrew, James, and John. And we're going to look at that today about the calling of God. How to understand the calling of God into full-time ministry. Father, Lord, please bless your word. I pray God you speak through me. Uh, this is already a second go at this and, um, so many things are just making this really hard today, Lord. I'm, I'm praying for grace. I'm praying for help because there's no way I'd be able to do this on my own in Jesus name. Amen. Now, as he walked by the sea of Galilee, we see Jesus Christ, not in a hurry. And in the 21st century, we see mankind in a big hurry. And if we are to be Christ-like, we ought not to be in a hurry for anything. We ought to move at the pace God tells us to move at. And I never see where Jesus ran. I never seen it. I see Jesus take his time, but not his time. His time is God's time. And his time is dedicated to doing his father's will. But in order to get to where he's going, he doesn't ride a horse. He doesn't ride chariots. He doesn't ride in a car. He doesn't fly a plane. Jesus Christ is slow to travel. And we're in such a hurry nowadays, and we have so much problem with that, that, that comes with the hustle and bustle of life. And, uh, our attitudes oftentimes are ignited by people that are in our way, people at lights that don't respond instantaneously when the light turns green and we lay on our horn. And uh, you might be hearing some stomach growling during this message, uh, preaching in a fastest state. It's 2.20 and uh, stomach's growling because I'm a little bit hungry, but it helps me to think clear so uh that's why i'm doing that now as he walked by the sea of galilee i'm not in a hurry to eat right now <laughs> though maybe it would have been best if i did if you start hearing all this grumbling of the stomach now as he walked by the sea of galilee he saw simon and andrew his brother casting a net into the sea we ought to walk circumspectly Jesus here is walking circumspectly. I'm sure God told him that his next duty was to find certain men. And he was walking and he was looking. And we need to be looking. We need to be looking for the next generation. We need to be looking for the next generation of preachers. Um, we're not calling apostles, but we are calling disciples. And we have to see who it is that God would have us to lay hands on. And the Bible says to lay hands upon no man suddenly. We don't see Jesus suddenly laying hands. We don't see Jesus suddenly making a call of these disciples. Everything he does is methodical. It's led by God. And this 
was by no chance that he walks by the Sea of Galilee. This is by no chance that there was a divine appointment that Simon and Andrew and James and John would be out there fishing or close to the seashore as they're getting done fishing. Oftentimes, fishermen would in Galilee would fish at night, and this is maybe at the end of their time fishing. Now, as he walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea. We have to be looking for the young people that would follow Christ, that would keep the church going. We have to keep our eyes peeled for those that may have uh, have it in them to, to do the work of the ministry as uh, these men did. We see by their profession, it goes along with what their new profession would be. They were fishing. They were fishers. And what does Jesus say? He says, and Jesus said unto them, come, ap- uh, come ye after me, and I will make you to become fishers of men. I think oftentimes we can gauge and we can see from the way a person is living their life before they even meet Christ, or if they're young in Christ, what uh, path they end up taking for their life may reflect what the spiritual path may be. Here we see that God calls fishermen because God is in the fishing business. He is fishing for souls. And he's going he's gonna, to uh, draw in all kinds. There's going to be big and little. There's going to be uh, <laughs> ugly and good looking. There's going to be poor. There's going to be rich. There's going to be a variety that God draws in. But God draws us into service. God draws certain individuals into the full-time ministry and we'll deal with also some that aren't called to that full-time ministry and jesus said unto them come ye after me and i will make you to become fishers of men and straightway they forsook their nets and followed him and i want to look at this from a a few different angles but straightway that word means right away that means immediately they forsook their nets This was their livelihood. This was their occupation. This was their means of taking care of their family, their means of making money. This is how they fed their family. This is how they brought home the bacon. And there's many different ways we could put it, but they forsook what they knew. And oftentimes God will cause us to step out of our comfort zone and make a decision of total surrender to his will that most people they're just not up for it and uh they did they count the cost and they think that the cost is too high they they look at jesus and they say uh you have no place to lay your head and you want me to follow you why so i end up like you they see jesus and they'll see jesus being mocked And sometimes the heart will say, do I really want to follow this man and even be partaker of mock uh, mockery being mocked for my faith? Got to count that cost, but straightway immediately. And we're losing that. We're losing uh, a generation to that immediate call to service. A lot of people, they don't feel that call anymore. A lot of people feel the call maybe after they've been called to service to leave the service of the Lord. And they're like Demas. Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world. But I think oftentimes people mistake their maybe speaking ability or their ability in their flesh or their God-given talent for the calling, the calling into the full-time ministry. And maybe that's why people end up quitting. Maybe that's why so many are falling out. But true men that are called into the ministry, I believe, ought to straightway, they ought to immediately follow that call. And when you don't, it brings problems. Because God wants to have his way. 
He's not going to cause you to be a robot. He's not going to cause you and and overthrow your free will, but he wants you to follow him uh, out of a, a free will, but he will also steer your way. He also will give you uh resistance when you're trying to go against his will. And we'll look at Jonah <laughs> and, and we'll see that. And I've felt that a lot in my life because I felt a calling since I was young, since I was probably in my teens and maybe even before being saved, I felt like I should be doing this. Like I'm, I'm meant for this preaching the word of God and being a pastor or possibly being an evangelist back then. And I never really felt like I would be a missionary, but pastor or evangelist was always what I felt in my heart that I could be. And, uh, I tried to do the work of an evangelist to make full proof of my ministry. And, uh, we have a street preaching ministry called not ashamed. And, uh, it's back there, right there, not ashamed of the gospel. And we go out and we preach in the streets. And, uh, I think a lot of people out there in the streets are in it more so not for fishing for men, but more so fishing for subscribers, fishing for, um, more views. Um, you know, I see so many that go to these sodomite parades or, uh, you know, some people say that's kind of offensive, but it is a Bible word or they go to the gay parades, but they're not gay. They're not happy. They're miserable. They'll put on a front like they're happy, but no man that does his own will, no man who rejects God is happy in this life. I guarantee you that they, they have no joy. Well, they might have temporary happiness. Happiness will give them that. But true peace, true joy that can only be filled by Jesus Christ and doing his will. You were created by him and for him. And if you're going to live for anything else, you're not going to be happy. So these men, these street preachers go to the gay parades. And I think they love controversy, a lot of them. And have you ever heard of not casting your pearl before swine? Your, don't cast your pearls before swine. Why? Because they're going to trample over that precious thing. And then they're going to rend you. And uh, they often say, I love you. Jesus loves you. I love you. And they say, get the F out of here. <laughs> we don't want to hear it. Leave. We're tired of you preaching at us or turn your microphone off. And then they say, well, I got every right to have my microphone on and they keep their microphone on. And even when people try to talk privately to some of the street preachers, they won't turn it off. You know why? Because it's about building my channel. It's about being controversial. It's about getting this stuff out to the YouTube land so that way I can make a name for myself as some great street preacher, you know, just like Simon the Sorcerer, you know, some people, maybe they don't love sorcery, but they love confrontation. They love uh, controversy. And so they're just going to get Jesus Christ to up their controversial means of argument. And uh, they're just going to go about causing strife, causing people to be angry. And uh, sometimes I understand why even the gays get upset with them. You know what? Why do you single them out? I understand preaching at a gay parade. And I and my best friend, he, he goes to those and <laughs> he don't go to them to, to hang out or to march in them. But he goes to uh, reprove them. He goes to preach in them. And oftentimes he finds himself alone when he goes. He'll announce and he'll let a lot of people know in the church, but there's not many that would ever turn up. Sometimes none will turn up for that. And it takes a brave man to do that. And um, so I commend anybody that will go to those, knowing that they're totally against you. But you have to understand that there are some that may want the truth. And you got to be led by the Spirit. And they have the right to hear the gospel just as much as anybody else does because God can save them out of that sin. God can save out of the deepest, darkest sins. Don't ever limit God. But we also need not to focus solely on what would bring uh, views, what would bring controversy, what would bring 
attitude and, and people getting angry and uh, persecution. And, you know, some people, they just, they did, they love to be persecuted. They live for that. And I understand the disciples rejoice after they were persecuted and we ought to rejoice too, but you ought not go around sniffing for it. Preach the gospel to every creature. Preach it to everybody. Wherever there's people, go there. But 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 God forbid that we would only make recordings of what will get views. What what about preaching just to the average person, the average people in a small town? Well, that's not fun. No, nobody's going to click on that. Why are you doing it? You need to examine that. You need to know why you're doing what you're doing because it will be examined at the judgment seat of Christ. God will put it under a magnifying glass and everything that you do for self glory or for self promotion, that's all going to be brought to naught. That's going to be counted zero, zero for reward. That's going to be wood. That's going to be hay and stubble. And God is looking for people that will serve him, not for what they can get out of it, but what God gets out of it. He deserves our service. He deserves us. He deserves our full attention. He deserves our full loyalty and uh, our surrender. And that's what happens when we're baptized. When we're baptized, we're showing that we died to ourselves and that we are to live after God and his will, that we're going to walk in a newness of life, not the same old life. But oftentimes, uh, I just heard uh, Spurgeon preaching on this, people get baptized and it's a farce. People get baptized and we don't see any death to the old life. We don't see any walk in newness of life. We don't see any desire to even go to church or to pray or to uh, read their Bible or to be a witness. And for you to be baptized and then yet still not be dead to yourself whatsoever that doesn't uh, show that that doesn't show anything of a new creature. That doesn't show anything of a new life that it's supposed to show. That's the first act of obedience is what that we're supposed to reckon ourselves dead to be baptized, to go down under that water. Also that shows submission that we submit to a man putting us down under that water. Ooh, we don't like submission, but right off the bat, God says, I want you to be baptized and I want you to submit getting off track again a little bit here. Now, as he walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. And Jesus said unto them, Come ye after me, and I will make you to become fishers of men. And straightway they forsook their nets and followed him. They didn't question him. They didn't say, Where are you going? They didn't say, How is this going to be funded? Or what are we going to do for work in the meanwhile? No, they didn't question it. They just followed. They just obeyed. And that's the way we need to be. We need to be quick to follow Jesus wherever he leads us. And sometimes he leads us out of our comfort zones and we have to be willing to follow wheresoever he leads us. And let's look at Luke chapter number five and verse number one. Luke chapter number five and verse number one. And pray for me. Uh, I'm feeling that call to be ordained and uh, I, I was going to be ordained a while back, but I'm working on trying to get my finances better in order. And, um, but I think now is the time. I think now is the time to be ordained. And I think now is the time to go into the ministry full time. I, I have been street preaching. I have been doing this and I've been going into jails and, uh, and nursing homes too at times. But, I think the call to be a pastor is, is next. And uh, just pray for me that I do God's will, that I find the right church and that God would have me to find the right people and people that are hungry for the word and uh, that will take to the preaching and the teaching and that will grow and that I could be a good shepherd and a good leader. Um, I'm, I'm pretty excited about it. And I have a feeling I think I know where God may be sending me. But uh, just going to have to be praying, and I, I pray that you pray for me too. So uh, until we get this all figured out here. 
Look at Luke chapter number five and verse one. And it came to pass that as the people pressed upon him to hear the word of God, he stood by the lake of Gennesaret and saw two ships standing by the lake. But the fishermen were gone out of them and were washing their nets. So here we see that the fishermen were washing their nets, and that's not exactly what's recorded in some of the other Gospels. And it's not a contradiction, but they may have just been finishing up and, and were washing their nets. And uh, it's kind of neat just to see the different angles that the different writers of the Gospels hit. Uh, some include certain parts that others don't include. And he entered into one of the ships, which was Simon's, and uh, prayed him that he would thrust out a little from the land. Uh, but before I get into that, let's look at verse 2 again. And saw two ships standing by the lake, but the fishermen were gone out of them and were washing their nets. Their nets needed to be washed. And that sounds kind of funny. And I had to look that up because you would think, well, they're in the water all the time. Isn't that kind of washing them? But then they get all kinds of slime and all kinds of stones and all kinds of mud and all kinds of stink from the fish and all different kinds of stuff, seaweed in it. And they have to clean those nets because they take those nets back home with them and they don't want that smell or going <laughs> throughout their house or, or their yard or wherever they put their nets, you know, and so they clean their nets and, you know, we have to clean our nets and we have to clean up, uh, you know, and, and have, uh, these these nets need taken care of. They need maintenance in order to do the job they're supposed to do. And our Christian life takes maintenance and we need washing. We need washing of the word of God so that way we have a better ability to be a fisher of men. And if you get away from mending your nets or washing your nets, uh, you're, you're going to have trouble being a witness because we're, we're clean by the washing of the word of God. And he entered into one of the ships, which was Simon's, and prayed him that he would thrust out a little from the land. And he sat down and taught the people out of the ship. And kind of neat because of the natural acoustics that Jesus took advantage of. Um, I bet that the waters were still and that the, the voice was more uh, projected because of the fact that he was out on that ship. And it was like an amphitheater. And before they had amplification... They use the land and its layout or Jesus, as he taught here, uh, taught the people and he sat down and he taught them. And that's kind of interesting, too. And I know Brother Poonin brought that up, that we see that Jesus would sit to teach. And then when he was preaching, he was standing up. But I think we ought to sit down and and be at the level of those that we're teaching not trying to elevate ourselves, but like a family gathered around. And that's kind of what I have here. You know, I, I like it to be as if you're sitting here at the other end of this table and I'm teaching you in an intimate way. And like a father would teach a son at the table. And I think that there's wisdom in sitting down and teaching. Now, when he had left speaking, he said unto Simon, Launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a draft. It looks like draught, but it's pronounced draft. And I just looked that up too. So that's going to be a drawing in a fish, a draft. And uh, that definition from the 18 Webster's 1828 is that which is taken by sweeping with a net as a draft of fishes. So he wants him to, by faith, launch out into the deep and uh, sometimes we got to get out of that comfort zone and let down your nets for a draft and i noticed that he said let down your nets and then he let down his net so there may have been a half obedience to this and maybe there could have been much more that was gained if he would have been completely obedient and Simon answering said unto him, Master, we have toiled all the night and have taken nothing. Nevertheless, at thy word, I will let down the net. And I don't, I'm not, still not sure why he says the net. And Simon answering said unto him, Master, we have toiled all the night. And um, man wasn't, 
man wasn't created to work at night. Even Jesus says that we work during the day and then night cometh when no man worketh. And sometimes we do things that is contrary even to our circadian rhythms that causes our bodies to die much earlier and shut down earlier and have problems. Uh, sometimes there's a, a myriad of ailments that come with night workers. And I worked a night shift when I worked at Suncrest for six years. And I think it did a number on my metabolism and all kinds of different things. And uh, I'm still trying to recover from that. And it, it's still sometimes hard to sleep at night. And um, we see that Simon's toiling all night and he's doing something that he's not even supposed to be doing. And oftentimes we're in our life doing things that are not the calling of God. It's not what God would have us to do. And whenever you do that, we're going to see that there's resistance or we're going to see that we're not being fruitful when we're out of our uh, calling, when we're out of what God's will is for our life. And I see in my own life sometimes, um, you know, I was trying to door dash and I was trying to be successful at that to pay my bills and make ends meet. And what did I see? I saw some success at it and I saw some resistance, but then I saw the door as it starts shutting more and more and I couldn't even get any more work. And it started off with uh, making a decision not to not to deliver a couple different items that were dirty, that, that they weren't good. One was, uh, there was an item for a morning after pill and I almost went and bought it. And then I thought about, I'm not going to contribute to somebody in a way it's almost like an abortion or it could be an abortion that if, if the conception just took place and then they're going to take a pill that's too close for my comfort that would, that would kill that baby if, as soon as it would, you know, or I, I don't know exactly how it works, but I didn't feel right about it. So I, uh, end up going back on that order and it, then it caused a problem for me as far as getting more orders and getting, uh, consistent work there, you know, and then there was another one that made it even worse. They wanted me to buy condoms for somebody. And I was going to do that too. And then I, uh, had my friend's son with me and he was helping me out and he's just 14 years old. And I thought what a bad testimony that would be, you know, and I end up, uh, not, not accepting that order. Uh, no, I accepted it, but then I had to go back on it. And then, um, that end up really costing me. But then I said, well, I'm, I'm not going to be a bad testimony in front of this, my friend's son. And then also, what if this is for some young kid? And then I went over to Taco Bell and some young couple came in there and it was prom night. And I thought, wow, I'm so glad that I made the right choice because I think if I would have went up to the door and I saw that it was some teenagers, I even if I did buy it, I probably would have just said, nah, you're not getting this. <laughs> I would have just <laughs> took it and threw it in the dumpster or something. So... I, I seen where the door starts shutting there. And then I also start working for my friend, uh, Rodrigo and, uh, was building some barbershops with him. And I appreciate the extra work and was trying to get out of the hole and trying to, you know, relieve some of this debt and catch up on bills. I'm just so far behind. And then what happened there, just not enough consistent work not enough consistent work. And I appreciate the little bit of work I had there, but I, I'm not a lazy person. I'm not looking to, to not, you know, work hard. If I need to, I, I will, you know, and if people need help, I'm there to help people. Sometimes it's hard work, but I, I'm there for people, you know? And so I, I, I felt like the Lord is shutting doors or the Lord is making things difficult when I'm trying to save my own life. If you save your life, you'll lose it. And uh, it's just so odd how everything seems like resistance towards me. And uh, I, I guess we can mention Jonah now. We've seen Jonah, when God called him to do a certain work and to go into Nineveh, he left. And what was he met with? A tempest. He was met with resistance, wasn't he? 
Why? Because he's going against the will of God. And I believe for a long time, God's been calling me in this direction. And I've never gotten satisfaction out of uh, just trying to be career minded or trying to live for this world. I put all my eggs in one basket. And um, I was just telling the Lord that right before I start teaching and preaching um, here, I said, Lord, I'm going to need help. There's a lot of stuff in my life where things are just coming to a head and um, I don't, I don't, I don't have anything, but maybe some loose change. And, um, but I'm trusting you and nevertheless, nevertheless at thy word, I will let down the net. I'll go do what you'd have me to do. If you want me to pastor, I'll pastor. Um, I'm, I'm tired of fighting and resisting. And, uh, so I start upping up, uh, the, the, the street ministry and going out in the streets more. And I want to do more and, and do what God would have me to do. And I'm getting peace and I'm getting joy and I'm getting all this restored and, uh, a closer walk with the Lord from it as a result of it. And you're always best. Your best bet is, is following God and, and immediately doing what God tells you to do. The longer you delay, the longer you kick at the pricks, as Paul did, the more you're just making it hard on yourself. And God would have you to obey him. God would have you to not toil and labor so hard and and see no, nothing come to fruition and see nothing work out. And sometimes I think that's by design. I don't think it was any accident that Peter wasn't able to uh, continue in this work. This is what he's known. He's a great fisherman. He's been fishing all his life, and yet he's not succeeding. And God shows a miraculous uh, draft, and he pulls in many fish. But what does it teach him? He teaches. He teaches him that you know. He teaches him humility. Wow! But then he doesn't say, "Wow, let's keep doing this." I like the way it was on the chosen. Like they kind of alluded to that, like, like kind of being funny. Like we could keep making money. Like we could, we could make some other big catches, you know, and maybe that might've been in his heart too, a little bit. Uh, I'm not saying it wasn't, but that's not recorded here. But in the Bible, he doesn't say, let's keep fishing, Lord. Let's make some money first. Let's try to get some scores settled or some um, debts paid. Let's try to uh, make some money to lay up. And uh, for my wife, even no, he by faith he uh, follows Jesus. But Simon answering said unto him, Master, we have toiled all night and have taken nothing. Nevertheless, at thy word, I will let down the net. And when they had this done, that's kind of a strange way to say it. And when they had this done, they enclosed a great multitude of fishes, and their net break. And God's way is always the best way. You want to see any kind of prosperity and not everybody you understand is called to a full-time ministry, but you want to see prosperity in the way you need to listen to the Lord. You need to do what he tells you to do. Um, and sometimes you might not prosper as far as making money, but you will prosper in a spiritual sense. You will prosper in your growth, your Christian growth, your walk with God, your, your ability to catch the multitudes your ability to reach the multitudes. Whereas you could barely reach any, God wants to have you to be a fisher of men. He wants to have you work and and serve him and be successful as a, as a minister um, of the gospel. And when they had this done, they enclosed a great multitude of fishes and their net break. And that's kind of funny too. I don't know if they had a replacement net or not, but he, he had their net break. And they beckoned unto their partners, which were in the other ship, that they should come and help them. And they came and filled both the ships so that they began to sink. And um, not exactly sure who the partners are. Um, could be James and John. When Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. And God always deals with men at salvation like this. You know you're a sinner, and you're humbled, and you're broken, and you, you're you not looking at everybody else, but you're looking at yourself. You're looking inwardly, 
and you know that you are unworthy. You're unworthy of his grace. You're unworthy of mercy. You're unworthy of any miracles. You're unworthy of, uh, of his presence. Look at Isaiah chapter six real quick. Isaiah chapter number six. I've gone here quite often, but this, this is the attitude I believe of everybody who truly meets the Lord at salvation or even further down in their walk, they're going to grow exponentially. If this happens, if they see God in his glory in the year that King Uzziah, Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon the throne high and lifted up and his train filled the temple above it stood the seraphims. Each one had six wings with twain. He covered his face and with twain, he covered his feet and with twain, he did fly. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the post of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. Then said I, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. And uh, we'll skip down a little bit. And verse 9 says, or excuse me, verse eight. Also, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then said I, here am I, send me. But it first came with brokenness, didn't it? First came with, um, with repentance and uh, 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 acknowledgement of your uncleanness. And God, before he sends you, he's going to have to break you down where he causes your uh your heart to change, your heart to, to see it's, it's undone and it needs to be made new. Uh, whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then said, I, here am I, send me. And he said, go and tell this people, hear ye indeed, but understand not and see ye indeed, but perceive not. Make the heart of this people fat and make their eyes heavy and shut their eyes, lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and convert and be healed. And uh, he went out with a negative message and he went out not to, make a bunch of converts. Isaiah didn't, but, uh, he had a job to do and, and, uh, he did his job. And here we have Peter broken in the same way and, uh, humbled in the same way. And he's looking at the King. Also, he's looking at King Jesus and he leaves all to follow him and to be a fisher of men for he was astonished and all that were with him at the draft of the fishes, which they had taken. And God is going to cause a lot of astonishment. He will show you his greatness. He will show you that he loves you. He will show you that he is able and he is able to uh, take care of you. He is able to bless you. You just got to trust him for he was astonished and all that were with him at the draft of the fishes, which they had taken. And so was also James and John, the son of Zebedee, which were partners with Simon and Jesus, so that they are the partners. <laughs> and so also was James and John, the son of Zebedee, the sons of Zebedee, which were partners with Simon. And Jesus said unto Simon, fear not from henceforth, thou shalt catch men. And when they had brought their ships to the land, they forsook all and followed him. Not too much of that going on. Not these days. Why? There's too much in this world that people want. Nobody wants to humbly follow their Lord that gave all for them. They don't want to give all back, but that's what Jesus, this, that's what he uh, requires in a disciple. You want to be a disciplined follower of Christ. You want to grow and, and be used to your full capacity. It's going to take that. It's going to take an immediate following of Jesus. And straightway they forsook their nets. We're going back to Mark chapter Number one and verse number 18 is straightway there forsook their nets and followed him, followed him. Mark chapter number five and verse 18 through 20. Let's look there real quick. We're going to see that some are called full time to the ministry. Some are called oftentimes even to leave where they're at. To re to relocate or to not even have a place to stay. That's full time, uh, a, <laughs> full time. Uh, a place of permanent residence. Look at Mark chapter number five and verse number, what did I say? Verse number 18 through 20. 
this is the man, man of Gadara. And Jesus healed him of all these evil spirits that were in him and cast them out. And then he was clothed and seated in his right mind. And uh, what does he say to Jesus? Verse 18. And when he was come into the ship, he that had been possessed with the devil prayed him that he might be uh, be with him. He wanted to follow Jesus. How be it? Jesus suffered him not, but saith unto him, go home to thy friends and tell them how great things the Lord have done for thee and hath had compassion on thee. And he departed and began to publish in Decapolis, Decapolis how great things Jesus had done for him. And all men did marvel. He was better off where he was uh, originally. He, he wasn't to leave that town. Those people knew who he was. They seen the madman. They seen him bound with fetters and chains. They seen him crying and cutting himself in the tombs. And for him to go somewhere where maybe that may sound, that might sound like a tall tale and they might not even know uh, or believe the legend of what this man was full of devils, uh, superhuman strength. This town knew him. This city knew him. And he went back and he was able to reach people that were astonished at his testimony. And sometimes God would have you to stay kaput uh, or stay put, not kaput. Stay put where you're at and uh, God will use you where you're at. And there's no crime in that. If God wanted you to leave your house, if God wanted you to leave your family, he'll call you. But he doesn't call everybody to leave all or to forsake all. You ought to be willing to. And I'm sure the Lord appreciates that. But sometimes what's best for us is to stay maybe in a local church and to serve under that local church and to grow in that local church and bless everybody in that local church. And that's not a second rate Christian, but we all have a certain uh, calling. We all have a certain ability and God wants to get the most out of our lives. And sometimes what is best for us and best for everybody that we may be able to reach is to stay where we're at. And we got to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit because we're not all going to leave our jobs. We're not all going to, you know, I mean, we need doctors out there and they're saved doctors and uh, they're going to be used in that field. They're saved athletes, saved baseball players, football players. And you know that there's people there that they can reach that I can't reach, but they can reach. God's got people positioned where he wants them. And sometimes it's it's in a trade and it's it's staying at the job and it's staying doing what you're doing. But then you're a witness on your job and you're a witness uh, wherever God puts you. And, and, and you have to just be willing to do what God has for you to do. You can't sit there and say, oh, God called this guy into full time ministry. So I'm going to do the same thing. God said, I don't want you following me. He didn't want that madman of Gadara to leave everything and follow him. He said, I got greater use for you. Stay where you're at. And he was able to reach those people in his own town. So not everybody. And sometimes it can be confusing because preachers or evangelists will try to push you sometimes into full time ministry. Or they'll guilt trip you. But don't don't you go. I've heard of men that went into the ministry or left as a missionary and and, and they flopped. And it's because I believe they were compelled, but they weren't compelled of the Holy Spirit. They were compelled of men to go. And God, God's got certain people built and, and, and geared that way to be a missionary. God's got certain people geared to be an evangelist. Some people are geared to be a pastor. You fulfill a role that you're not meant to fulfill. You may cause more harm than good. And uh, we got to have the wisdom of God. We have to understand that we're not all cookie cutter Christians. We're not all called to the same thing. In the body of Christ, there's all different kinds of gifts and God has gifted some where others are lacking and we need one another to, to come to the fullness of what God would have us to be as Christians. And uh, it's a blessing. I, I'm, I'm glad God saves a variety of people. He calls a variety of people. He calls some to stay, he calls some to go. And uh, there's a balance to this thing. And the more you read the Bible, you see the balance. You read one passage like this and you say, well, I got to sell everything I have and I'm going to have to leave uh, my, my family and I'm going to have to go out on a mission field. But God does not want everybody out on a mission field. 
but your job could be that mission field. You know, even let's start with your own house, your household, your family, your wife, your kids, if they're not converted, your, uh, your cousins, why don't you reach them? Why don't you start there? And maybe God might open a door later down the road. Mouth's getting awfully dry. Let's look at Luke chapter number 14 and verse 16. Luke chapter number 14 and verse number 16. These pages are so thin. If I touch something wet and just slightly damp and then I touch these pages, it'll make them all wrinkled. So uh, I got my little drink here and I don't want to wreck my pages, especially when I want to write on my side margins. Luke 14 and verse number 16. Then said he unto him, this is Jesus speaking, a certain man made a great supper and bade many, and sent his servants at supper time to say to them that were bidden, Come, for all things are now ready. And they all with one consent began to make excuse. The first said unto him, I have bought a piece of ground, and I must needs go and see it. You didn't even see the piece of ground? You bought it without even looking? That's kind of crazy. Sounds like an excuse. It is an excuse. I pray thee, have me excused. And another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen, and I go to prove them. Shouldn't you test them out before you buy them? Same with the land. Shouldn't you check that out before you buy it? I pray thee, have me excused. All the excuses. And another said, I have married a wife, and therefore I cannot come. You know, Peter could have used that excuse because he was married. But he didn't use that excuse, did he? No. He went to that wedding. And, uh... He, he, he forsook all. So that servant came and showed his Lord these things. Then the master of the house, being angry, said to his servant, Go out quickly into the streets and lanes of the city and bring in hither the poor and the maimed and the halt and the blind. And that's what we do when we go out street preaching. Anybody. We're looking for anybody to bid to come to that supper, to come to that wedding, to be married to Jesus, to, to know him as Savior. And we're not looking for just rich people. We're not looking for just religious people. We're looking for everybody. And we're looking for those that are down and outers. We're looking for the poor. We're looking for all kinds. Because when we draw a net, what kind of fish do you catch? You're not saying, well, I'm only going to catch this. You don't know what you're going to catch. You'll catch all different kinds. And the servant said, Lord, it is done as thou hast commanded, and yet there is room. And the Lord said unto the servant, Go out into the highways and hedges and compel them to come, and that my house may be filled. For I say unto you that none of these or none of those men which were bidden shall taste of my supper. Many are called, but few are chosen. And God's called everybody to repentance, but you're only chosen once you choose to not have an excuse, once once you choose to obey the gospel, once you choose to repent and believe the good news. Once you choose to to lose your life that you may gain eternal life. But so many have excuses. So many people, they'll never come to know Jesus as Savior because their wife is unconverted and they don't want that to cause trouble in their marriage or they don't know what it may cause for their relationships or for uh, their businesses or um you know, they don't know that the Lord may call them to forsake all. And they they look ahead and they count the cost and they say, I'm not willing to lose what I have in this life. And the young rich ruler, he wasn't willing to forsake all. And he didn't have to leave all, but you have to be willing to. But he walked away sorrowfully, didn't he? Because he had great possessions. And oftentimes people that are rich will never enter into the kingdom of God. It's harder or easier for an camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. Why? Because they trust in certain riches and they probably fear that if God saved them, they know some saved people that give a lot of money to uh, their tithe and offering to their local church or they support missionaries with that money and they hold on to it and they don't want God to touch their money. They don't want God to, to touch their lands or they maybe know and grew up in church and knew that uh, the early church sold all that they had and that they were all had all things in common. 
And they say, what if God called me to do that? Well, they sit down and they count the cost and they say the, co the cost is too high. I have too many great possessions. So they make excuse and they don't come to the wedding. And God says, there will be people that will enter that wedding that will have not on a wedding garment and he'll find them and he'll cast them out of that wedding in the outer darkness. And there's going to be religious people there, but they're going to be cast out. Excuse me. Let's look at verse 19. And when he had gone a little further thence, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who also were in the ship mending their nets. And straightway he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the ship with the hired servants and went after him. So we see here others called into that full-time ministry, and they were mending their nets. They were fixing their nets. And I heard that's a very tedious task to, to take on mending the nets. And they didn't say, well, let us finish mending these nets. We're almost done. No, they straightway, immediately they left them. And they also left the ship. They left their, uh, their, their, their father even behind, Zebedee. And sometimes people won't leave their family. Some people, they won't even leave their father or their mother to, uh, to do what God would have them to do. And some he's called to full-time ministry. And you've got to be willing to forsake your job. You have to be willing to forsake your father or your mother. You have to be willing to forsake your your um, your family, you know. And not when you go out to be a missionary, that's that's not what I'm saying. I'm not saying you forsake your wife and you forsake your children, um, unless God told you to, and 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 they had some other means that be to be taken care of. Um, I'm not saying that that doesn't happen, but. There's also those that will go into the ministry full time, but then yet God still wants you to be a father. God still wants you to be a husband. God wants you to have a balanced life and you still have to take care of them. And some people, they kind of sacrifice their children to the ministry and then they lose their children and then they lose their children to the world and they lose their children because they never had a dad. Their dad was always gone preaching in meetings and, and, uh, you know, and it, they would have liked to have a dad to play catch with them. They would have liked to have had a dad to read them bedtime stories at night, but dad was never there because dad was made an idol out of the ministry. And you can even do that and you, you can take things too far. And, uh, cause God calls some to, to leave sometimes even their wife for maybe a period of time, but does he, you have to know what God's telling you to do. And you got to understand that you're also one flesh with, with who you marry. And then you're also responsible to children. So you, each man may have a different calling, but you got to know what you're doing when God calls you and you got to understand what his calling is. And that takes discernment. That takes prayer. That takes sometimes fasting. That takes uh, seeking the mind of God as to what he's calling you to do. And uh, there's a lot more I could probably say, and um, we're not going to get into any further. We're just going to stop there. This has been approved unto God. I hope this made sense to you. I felt like I was having a little bit of a tough time with it. And um, the Lord kind of seems to have me go through all kinds of things that I'm preaching and teaching either before or after. And I believe that right now I'm being called and I'm willing to leave my uh, nets and leave my way of making money and and uh, trust that the Lord will provide and trust that the Lord will take care of me and meet supply my needs. I may be broke right now and it may be tough for a minute, but I know God knows where I'm at. And uh, just pray for me that God would uh, have me be used where he would have me to be used and uh, that I would be able to help the people he would have me to help. And, uh, and if I have maybe the lines crossed or the wires crossed, that um, that I would know the difference. And if God would have me to stay at my local church, that I'd be willing to stay there too. You know, maybe I maybe I'm just going to be ordained and and just stay a street preacher and uh, pre preaching in the jails. And I don't know. It, it, it's it's fine, whatever the Lord wants. But um, I'm pretty excited because I do feel His calling, and I just pray that everything would go well and you would keep me in your prayers and. Uh, I appreciate every bit of it. I appreciate you coming and listening. 
and uh, thankful for this ministry. And uh, also like and subscribe. You know, I don't say that almost ever. And also that I have a PayPal account on there too. And if you felt led to give a monetary gift, I appreciate that too, especially considering uh, I, ain't, I ain't got anything right now. So that's not good English, but <laughs> that's the truth. God bless you. Appreciate it.